Listen only mode. Well, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, this is Lauren Wenzel from the National Marine Protected Area Center, and I'm happy to welcome you to the latest webinar in our series on um, MPA networks. And today we're going to be talking about uh, recommendations for sustainable recreation in U.S. marine protected areas. And we have a couple of speakers with us today, Charlie Wally from our own National Marine Protected Area Center and Priscilla Brooks from the Conservation Law Foundation. Um, I'd also like to thank our partners, EDM Tools and Open Channels, for collaborating with us on this webinar series. Before we get started, I just wanted to mention that we are going to be having plenty of time for questions and comments at the end. So please go ahead and type in your questions in the question box as we go along, and uh, we'll be getting to those at the end of the presentation. Uh, so now what I'd like to do is just briefly introduce our speakers. Um, Charlie Wally is the Senior Scientist for the National Marine Protected Areas Center and one of the founding members of the center. And he is currently focused, his work is currently focused on understanding and analyzing human uses of the ocean. And Priscilla Brooks is the Director of the Ocean Conservation Program at the Conservation Law Foundation. And she's also a senior economist there. Uh, that is a member-supported nonprofit organization and is New England's leading environmental advocacy organization. And she is also a member of the Marine Protected Areas Federal Advisory Committee and was the chair of the subcommittee that worked on recreation and MPA issues. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Charlie Wally. Okay, thanks, Lauren, and thank you all for uh, spending some time with us. Uh, today, Priscilla and I want to talk to you uh, about an important issue and one that is growing in importance um, over time, and that is the the implications of recreational uses in marine protected areas in the United States. Uh, what we'll present to you is a combination of a summary of the work that we've done within the MPA Center and then more importantly uh, the, the work that our MPA Federal Advisory Committee has done in the past year and a half or so to make recommendations on this topic to both NOAA and the Department of Interior. So uh, I'll begin with a, a couple of little background slides to let you know who we are and what we do and why we do what we do. And then Priscilla will take over and talk about the uh, Federal Advisory Committee or the FACTS work on recreational uses. Um, <clears throat> that's it. Next, there. So the MPA Center, as, as some of you probably know, was established by a presidential executive order in 2000, signed by President Clinton. Uh, it's a collaboration between NOAA and officially the Department of Commerce and the Department of Interior and all of its conservation bureaus. It really grew out of the, the executive order and the MPA Center, the growing interest and frankly, growing concerns about MPAs and their use as conservation tools in the late 90s. And as a result, the, the national response was to create this executive order that gave some policy direction to the government on how best to use this tool to meet multiple conservation objectives. And as part of that effort, the MPA Center was established within NOAA, and it's primary mission is to establish and support a uh, comprehensive national system of MPAs in the U.S., which we have established and are growing as we speak. And to that end, a lot of our work is focused on uh, serving a, as a hub for building innovative partnerships and tools that are designed to help protect those special places. So we're really, in, in addition to coordinating the system, we're in a kind of MPA support role as well. There, we have three areas of focus, uh, just to cover these briefly. Uh, one is building capacity in protected area management programs so that they can more effectively manage the resources they're charged with protecting. As we all know, that's a, that's a huge challenge and something that will probably never go away. Uh, the second is communicating and engaging with stakeholders increasingly to help connect them and their communities to the protected areas that they use. And that's kind of at the heart of a lot of the work that we and the FAC have been doing over the past couple of years. And then finally, we, we have a kind of uh, a role, it's not so much a focus, but 
we see our role as being a, an honest broker, a neutral source of information for MPA issues, uh, science, information, and tools for all interested groups and all stakeholders and basically anybody who has an interest in or is somehow touched by MPAs are our clients. Next, please. Next slide, thanks. So <clears throat> to focus this down a little bit, uh, we've been interested in uh, the general topic of ocean uses for probably about a decade. And the reason for that is really simple. You know, MPAs are, are really uh, places within which we attempt to manage our uses and their impacts for some conservation objective. And that's, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but that's, that's essentially what they are. And as a result, it's incredibly important for us <clears throat> as a community, both managers and stakeholders, to really understand what those uses are why they happen, what their impacts are, and what their benefits are, so that we can more effectively manage them toward the conservation ends that we seek. So to that end, we've been doing a, a lot of different kinds of things in the MPA Center. One is we've been uh, working with many partners uh, to conduct participatory mapping of ocean uses in different places around the U.S bringing in people who know the region and know the use well to have an interactive mapping session. Uh, that stuff is still going on. The, the current project involves uh, Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii. And that's in partnership with BOEM and with many people within NOAA. We uh, published a, what we call the Common Language of Ocean Uses earlier this year, which is intended to provide a, a, a sort of a taxonomy, if you will, for describing and discussing and understanding ocean uses in terms that we can all use sort of interchangeably. Uh, we recently published a blog on recreation in MPAs and on open channels a few months ago. And then some ongoing work is, involves a survey of recreational uses in all US MPAs, which we're in the midst of uh, developing and getting approval for, and sometime within the next few months, will be distributing to MPA managers for their input on what this trend really is and how significant it is and what their concerns are. We're also working on <clears throat> kind of the other side of the coin, which is what do these uses do to and among each other by developing profiles of, of each use and analyzing their conflicts and their compatibilities in space and time. And then finally, we're, we've recently been invited to uh, join the Interagency Visitor Use Management Council, which is uh, a, a group of uh, many agencies, mainly Department of Interior, uh, Department of Defense, USDA, and now NOAA, who are focused and have been for some time on, on these very questions of how do we effectively manage visitors' use of protected areas in such a way that they can be sustained ecologically over time. So that, that group has a lot of promise. It's directly relevant to the work we're doing, and I think it's going to be very helpful in the future. Okay, next, please. So <clears throat> why do we care about this stuff? Um, recreation is supposed to be a good thing. People enjoying MPAs is supposed to be a good thing. So what's the problem? And what, we, what we've been seeing, uh, all of us in our various ways and through some growing bodies of data and through an informal survey we did with MPA managers, that there's a trend <clears throat> nationally of uh, recre traditional existing recreational uses are expanding. New uses are emerging like stand-up paddle boards, which for all intents and purposes didn't exist five or ten years ago and now are everywhere and becoming kind of a, an, an issue in MPAs. The MPAs themselves are, are becoming destinations for ocean recreation. And to help that along, there are several national initiatives that are focused on encouraging public use of federal lands and waters for outdoor recreation, all of which is a good thing. But there is the possibility that there is such a thing as too much of a good thing. and so. There, is, there are growing concerns among the MPA uh, practitioner community 
about the ecological impacts of these expanded uses and about conflicts among uses. And in addition, the, we've discovered through some informal surveys that not surprisingly, a lot of MPAs in the U.S. at least were not set up to address a lot of these uses in, in their earlier years and generally lack information and tools that they need to sustainably manage those uses over time. So this this seems like a, a perfect situation of a, a huge opportunity to bring people to the ocean, engage them in conservation, and yet there is the risk of overuse and the consequences of that for the long-term survivability of the MPA. So that becomes a sort of interesting problem that we've picked up and asked our advisory committee to help us think through. In the next slide, please. So who, who are these people? Um, Priscilla is one of them. <clears throat> the, the fact, we call it, was established in uh, 2003 through the, the executive order that created the MPA Center and that called for the National System of MPA. Its job is to advise uh, NOAA through the Department of Commerce and the Department of the Interior on a variety of, of significant MPA matters. Uh, the current membership has 20 seats representing uh, a, a very diverse spectrum of ocean interests and uh, sectors from recreation to science to management to heavy industry to fishing, you name it. There is an ongoing uh, public nomination process which is about to conclude which will replace half of the existing members. The, the fact um, works through a charge that we develop with them. <coughs> Excuse me, and typically that charge has a couple of different themes sometimes closely related, sometimes not. And those themes are reflected in subcommittees that work uh, relatively independently and with input and support from the MPA Center. So it's, it's a true collaboration between the, the center and by extension the federal government and these ocean interest stakeholders who are gathering together voluntarily to help us think through some, some really meaty problems. And this topic of how best to manage and encourage and support and sustain recreation is one of those. So we turned to the FAC, uh, I guess two years ago, and said help. And uh, Priscilla is going to describe uh, what they did to answer that call. So I think you're up, Priscilla. Priscilla, perhaps you're on mute. She's not showing up as mute, but she's not coming through. Priscilla, we can't hear you. Um, Priscilla, in, if the problem, uh, you could, the, the presentation is working fine. Um, if the, the problem is with the audio. Uh, perhaps you could try pulling the headset out and using just your computer speakers and seeing if that works. Or, and if that doesn't work, calling in on the phone. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, we yes, can. Yeah. Okay, great. Ah, sorry about that. How odd. Um, let me get in the slideshow mode here. Great. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, again, it's Priscilla Brooks, and I direct the Ocean Conservation Program at Conservation Law Foundation. Um, we are based in New England, and we are an environmental nonprofit whose mission is to protect New England's environment for all people. So, um, so 
Charlie teed up uh, the NPA FAC and our charge from the Department of Interior and the Department of Commerce. And the charge was um, somewhat broad, uh, and it was basically to consider recreation and tourism in the nation's NPAs and opportunities and challenges related to recreation and tourism uh, in the nation's MPAs. And um, that, you know, this was related to two um, executive orders issued by uh, President Obama on, you know, the great outdoors and recreation. So the fact um, mulled that over and um, decided to focus their effort on developing recommendations for managing recreational use to sustain the natural and cultural assets of uh, U.S. NPAs. So, um, so uh, as Lauren mentioned, I, I chaired this subcommittee. And uh, I just wanted to mention that um, I was joined on this subcommittee by uh, Karen Garrison from the Natural Resources Defense Council, George Geiger, who was the former chair of the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council, um, John Jensen, who is a marine educator with Sea Education Association, Steve Kroll, um, who is um, a Great Lakes diver and very involved um, with the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, Hans Radke, uh, is a natural resource economist out of Oregon. Uh, Michelle Ridgway is a environmental consultant in Alaska. Sarah Robinson uh, is a lawyer and a social scientist from Gloucester, Massachusetts, fishing port. And then finally, Steve Welsh, who is a commercial fisherman um, out of New England. So you can see it was a very, we had a very broad swath of stakeholders that spent some time together to uh, take a look at this issue and come up with recommendations. So we uh, produced, you know, we basically engaged in, you know, producing several products and also um, uh, having some webinars. Um, so the first thing that we did was we sent a letter to the Secretaries of Commerce and Interior to, um, to let them know that we were doing this work and, uh, you know, call their attention to the issue um, and to uh, ask them to identify recreation, recreational use in MPAs as a priority issue uh, for NOAA and for the Department of Interior and to um, support NOAA's effort to um, collect information about recreational use in marine protected areas. And to that end, um, one of the first things that the FAC or our subcommittee set out to do was to develop a survey of, uh, that we would send to MPA managers of every single MPA uh, in the United States in the U.S. system. And there's quite a few of them. <coughs> I think there's 1,600. So we developed a survey, um, spent some time doing that because we felt that it was important to, you know, have an information baseline upon which to make our recommendations. Um, we fairly quickly ran into the wall of the Office of Management and Budget and the, you know, very complicated protocols that one needs to go to in order to actually conduct a survey of humans. <laughs> so um, that got put on hold, and, and Charlie will talk about that again, because we are moving forward with that. But um, instead, um, as a, to mitigate, you know, not being able to do a full survey, we conducted um, a webinar of several MPA managers from around the country, including uh, the Florida National Marine Sanctuary, Florida Keys. Uh, the Gateway National Recreation Area in New Jersey and New York, um, the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, the Lower Suwannee, Crystal River, Cedar Key, and Chesahawitska, pardon the pronunciation, <laughs> National Wildlife Refuges. Um, 
And then we also talked to the National Park Service's Ocean and Coastal Resources Program. So we had quite a lot of uh, input. We also um, did do a very informal survey of NPA managers that attended uh, the George Wright Society Annual Conference. So, so we started that way. And based on all of that information, um, we developed two formal products. The first was a set of recommendations for management practice practices for ecologically sustainable recreation. Um, and those were issued in the form of a letter to uh, the Secretary of Commerce, <clears throat> the head of NOAA, and uh, the Secretary of Interior. And then we um, joined forces with um, the, uh, sanc the National Marine Sanctuary Sanctuary Advisory Committees um, around the country, the chairs of those committees. We had a joint meeting, and we developed a joint call to action on this topic, um, which is now making its way uh, around the different uh, national marine sanctuaries in the country to be approved by their, formally by their sanctuary advisory committees. So, so what I'm going to do um, in the next few minutes is go through in some detail um, the recommendations on uh, recreation management that the NPA FAC developed. Um, and, uh, and then we'll open this up to questions. So, so first, we um, felt it important to, to develop a, a kind of preamble to state sort of um, some of the guiding principles that we were operating under when we were developing these, uh, these recommendations. And so the first was that we wanted to recognize that the nation's MPAs um, included some of the country's most important biologically rich and culturally important coastal and marine waters. These places are our national treasures. Um, and that uh, coastal and ocean recreation was expanding rapidly particularly in, uh, in MPAs. And also that uh, we wanted to recognize and state outright that this growing recreational use wasn't necessarily a bad thing, that in fact it held tremendous promise for human health, fitness, well-being, uh, economic development, and that deeper human connection to the natural world and our cultural heritage. Um, but we wanted to underscore that recreation can pose challenges and risks to these special places if it is not anticipated and managed proactively. Uh, and very, very importantly, we wanted to state that the quality of recreational uses within, within MPAs depends on the quality and resilience of the natural environment. So again, um, our, we had one overarching recommendation, and then we filled it in with some, some more detailed recommendations. But that was to recognize, again, that the quality of recreational use is dependent on the health of the ecosystem and the preservation of cultural assets, and to adopt strategies to actively manage suitable recreation to sustain the ecological integrity and cultural heritage of the area. So under that, we had um, you know, four more detailed, specific recommendations um, for MPA managers. This, this document really was you know, not only targeted to the bosses, the secretaries, but also to the managers of our MPAs. <laughs> So the first recommendation was, you know, essentially to, to, um, to understand what's going on in your MPA, to document patterns, trends, um, and limits in existing and emerging recreational uses, to support that kind of research. Because if you don't have a full understanding of the kinds of uses um, 
and the extent of those uses in your MPAs, it's, it's hard to manage them. So um, we made various recommendations on um, assessing the compatibility of recreational uses with the MPA's mandated purpose, and that varies widely and is very specific to the MPA. Um, also to determine carrying capacity. That is, you know, what is the threshold of recreational use at which adverse impacts may occur? You need to really understand um, how much is enough and how much is too much. Uh, and then along with that, you know, understanding what your carrying capacity is, then figure out whether or not the MPA is at or exceeding this capacity. So then um, it was important to consider compatibility and conflict between co-occurring uses. Charlie mentioned not only that there are, you know, growing use of MPAs, but there, with that comes conflict. Um, and then finally we felt that it was important to also consider not just what was happening on the water, but consider the surrounding community's capacity to accommodate uh, the growing number of visitors to MPAs. The second, um, the second um, sort of sub-recommendation we had um, was various um, suggestions for components of management plans or that management plans and actions needed to address certain things. And um, these are all, um, you know, I think fairly straightforward. Uh, we wanted to have a, you know, monitoring um, monitoring in the MPAs, monitoring for recreational use, monitoring for ecological um, health, you know, a lot of different indicators there, um, and also provisions for adaptive management. Um, we um, think that management plans should consider the, you know, the origins of recreational use and what's driving recreational use, the impacts of recreational use, both ecological, cultural, and economics. Uh, again, um, manage for compatibility of recreational use with MPA mandates, as well as compatibility between different kinds of uses. Um, again, uh, manage with uh, carrying capacity in mind. And um, the MPA FAC also suggested that, you know, there could be conflict reduction could happen through the use of zoning or other means. Um, and then finally, um, it was, and this really was woven throughout our recommendations, but, you know, the question of, you know, what are the implications of climate change? How is climate change going to impact you know, recreational use, natural and cultural assets of the MPA, and the infrastructure surrounding the MPA and its management. And then finally, um, we called for periodic evaluation of management uh, effectiveness. Another focus, um, uh, you know, a sub-recommendation was, um, of course, to strengthen compliance and enforcement of NPA regulations. You know, always a challenge. <clears throat> but I think we came up with some, some kind of, some good ideas. One was to add the NPA boundaries to NOAA's navigational products, so to charts, to online uh, mapping programs, GIS programs, and work with also with the private sector chart providers um, to disseminate MPA boundary information and regulations. So, you know, having an app that a recreational user could just, you know, dial in on their cell phone and be able to see, you know, understand that they were in an MPA, they understood the, you know, geographic boundaries of the NPAs and also could have access immediately to regulations <clears throat> that were relevant to them. There could be a lot of work done there. Um, also, um, it was important to understand, uh, analyze, um, you know, potentially damaging activities, understand, 
you know, what those impacts are and to proactively ahead of time evaluate, you know, different responses to address those issues and be prepared to address those issues. Again, uh, going back to um, the navigational products, but even more um, in a more focused way, um, the MPA fact felt that um, there was great opportunities to, through education um, and engagement with recreational users, to um, to uh, make the users of MPAs also the stewards of MPAs and ambassadors of the MPAs. Um, you know, so to create and and to create a culture of compliance by doing that. Um, so there was there was quite a lot of discussion about how to empower recreational users to be stewards of the resource, um, and also you know um, that would also help MPA visitors to enjoy the MPAs in a safe way as well. Uh, we called on training for enforcement personnel. Um, we recognize that that is there's a there's a lot lacking there. Um, and then finally, um, we felt that with respect to compliance and enforcement, we could go a long way by engaging the recreational businesses that are operating in MPAs to use the best management practices and to promote responsible recreation among their clients. And to that, um, to that end, the final uh, recommendation of the FAC was um, was this idea of forging and maintaining uh, public, private, and interagency uh, partnerships to leverage um, resources to support um, proactive management of recreational use in MPAs. Um, and again. Um, to do all the things that I've just been talking about, to communicate, educate um, the public, to um, acquire um, technical assistance and data to, to monitor and to manage the MPA. Um, and, um, you know, some of the obvious partnerships were partnerships with academia with state and local um, resource managers and tribal agencies, Sea uh, Grant, friends groups, recreational industry groups, historical societies, NGOs, and etc. So the um, so that was the gist of our our recommendations. Um, and but we also um, at the same time we sort of sprung off of those recommendations and worked with um, the National Marine Sanctuary Sanctuary Advisory Committees. Um, the chairs of those committees ha happen to be meeting at the same time and place <laughs> that the MPA FAC was meeting. We were having our separate meetings, but we had an opportunity to come together and to bat around this issue of uh, recreational use in the MPAs. And um, we, uh, we developed a um, a pretty powerful document, you know, uh, somewhat similar but a little bit different from um, the MPA facts recommendations. Um, but we, you know, we wanted to raise um, our concerns, our collective concerns about growing recreational use, and also opportunities to um, manage recreational use and in doing so to um, engage visitors in the, you know, conservation and stewardship of these special places. So um, our, these recommendations essentially, um, you know, embraced um, the administration's um, interest in, um, in getting people outdoors to enjoy our um, special places. Um, we, um, we also highlighted the need to, to again, to, um, 
to understand um, what kind of use is going on in NPAs and why people come here. Um, and again, you know, calling on the the government to um, to collect information on the the status of recreational uh, uses of MPAs and emerging trends, social and cultural economic benefits, and the possible detriments of those uses to coastal communities, um, and how recreational use fits into a broader and evolving picture of of commercial, military, scientific, and tribal and indigenous uses in these areas along our coast. Um, again, we underscored um, the importance of sustaining the ecosystems um, as the fundamental, um, fundamental driver of recreation. Uh, again, called for, uh, for the agencies to engage recreational users to become ocean stewards. And finally, um, our kind of zinger <laughs> at the end of this, this um, document was, you know, uh, asking uh, the feds to commit the necessary resources to make this happen, to not just put these recommendations on a shelf and say thank you very much, but to actually, um, to actually commit uh, the resources and the agency staff to advance this issue. So um, I'm going to turn this back over to Charlie, who's going to um, sum up, um, you know, why we engage in this work. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Priscilla. Um, so that's a good question. Why do we do this? You know, the, this idea of the possibility of too much recreation is, is not a new concept and often many MPAs have been struggling with this, some effectively and some not for decades. <clears throat> but it seems to us and to the FAC and to many others that that this trend is accelerating. The opportunities are growing as well as the risks and it's time for some concerted action to try to catch this wave before it's too late. And so <clears throat> what we were trying to do, the outcomes we're seeking, is to, through these recommendations <clears throat> and through the call to action, to encourage federal, primarily, MPA agencies through the, their departments to develop and adopt appropriate management practices for ecological sustainability of recreational uses in their sites. And that is, um, I, we believe, is, is easily, you know, more easily done as a collective effort than as a one-off site-by-site, manager-by-manager. So we're trying to, in, in a sense, build a, a movement for dealing with this trend while there's still time to take advantage of it and to minimize the risks. As part of that effort, uh, we see there are tremendous opportunities for forging partnerships that we've never, many of us, engaged in before with the actual user groups and with industry, even with uh, larger entities like the military, that actually take advantage of the expanding recreation to further ocean conservation in these areas. And then finally, and, and maybe fundamentally, uh, we're seeking to use all of this effort to create and maintain stronger connections between the visitors to MPAs and the special places that they care about. So what, what we were after, and uh, the heavy lifting is continues, <clears throat> is to, in a, in a sense, change the way the federal government approaches this idea of recreation from what many believe is the status quo now is we kind of have a patchwork quilt of measures to deal with it on a local scale while we're encouraging it nationally uh, and internationally and move toward a more integrated approach where both of those efforts are melded together seamlessly and to the advantage both of the user communities and the MPAs. So that's where we're headed. Uh, there's a lot more to do to, to take these ideas 
that the advisory committee uh, developed and that the sanctuary advisory councils are endorsing <clears throat> and actually turn them into policy and action within the federal government. So uh, many of you may be in a position to help us do that, either through your own jobs or through people you know. And <clears throat> I think that if we are successful, we'll be able to strengthen our MPAs and uh, broaden the user base while actually ensuring uh, even better sustainable conservation over time. So I think that's it for us. Priscilla, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I'd only add that, you know, from my perspective as a stakeholder, that, um, you know, the experience in creating these two documents and these st strong set of recommendations was uh, really remarkable that such a, a broad set of stakeholders could come together and, um, you know, forge a consensus set of recommendations that um, underscored how important it was to um, uh, to protect the the ecosystem, to make sure that that fundamental in ingredient to all the recreational services that we want and enjoy um, was healthy. So, um, so. Uh, we, um, these documents are all available on the Marine Protected Areas uh, website, which uh, you can see here. These are the, these are the addresses. Um, if you go to the mpa.noaa.gov uh, website and look under the Federal Advisory Committee and Products, they're all there. And, um, you know, I'm happy to um, take any questions or emails later on, um, and so this is Charlie's and my um, my uh, contact information. So thank you very much for listening in. Okay, thanks very much, Priscilla and Charlie. I'm going to go ahead and go to some of the questions that have come in, and I'm also going to invite anyone who has questions to go ahead and send those in. Uh, I'm going to go right to the tough ones first on carrying capacity, and, and this is for either Priscilla or Charlie, whoever wants to, to ask the, answer this, but there's a question about how is it possible to determine carrying capacity when we have so little knowledge of the biological conditions and underlying productivity and resilience of most habitats and protected areas, and who is going to conduct this, this science necessary to make these determinations? So we've got the science question, and then in addition to that, we have this question about allocation and if there are conflicts between recreational and commercial users, how do we make those decisions about who gets priority? Um, can you hear me, Lauren? Yes. Okay. I'll just uh, say one thing. I'm going to turn it over to the scientist, Charlie. But, uh, you know, the MPA fact, we talked about this. Um, we know that it's that's not an easy task to determine carrying capacity. But also at a you know, more basic level, it just seemed to us that you know, there's a limit to the amount of um, recreational use, human uses that um, a one area can sustain. That you know, we need to figure that out in whatever way you can. It might, you know, maybe at first it's not super scientific, but you need to determine, you know, how much is too much. And, um, and couple that obviously with, you know, the information, as much information about the marine environment and the health of the marine environment as you can. But this was a very, you know, visceral feeling that at the very core, you had to figure out, you know, how much use was too much use and manage for that. Charlie, do you want to add on to that? Well, I guess the easiest thing for me to say was that's right. <clears throat> uh, it's, a, it's an incredibly complicated question and one for which there is no answer currently. Um, we, we do recognize that that the science underlying that question is is very complex and difficult and, and really not ready for prime time in the oceans, I believe. Uh, but I think that, like Priscilla, there there may be some sort of more higher level practical approaches that we can start with to develop 
some sorts of flexible indicators and thresholds that, that give a manager a sense that they're getting to the level where there are problems developing, either with the ecosystem or with other uses or what have you. <clears throat> our, our hope with this, this whole effort, actually, is to turn that and other kinds of questions into uh, research and action agendas. So we're, we're well aware that <clears throat> the ability to do that on a, on a rigorous level is just, we're nowhere near that and we may never get to it, particularly with climate change and the complexities we're seeing now. But <clears throat> we think that if we have a more focused research and assessment and policy analysis effort going on to begin to develop these tools, we'll be better off than where we are now. So these are, some of these recommendations are more aspirational, and, and the point is to turn those aspirations into action. Okay, great. Um, there's a couple of questions that I think have a quick answer. Someone asked about recording. Uh, will we be able to access a recording of this or a PDF? And the answer is yes. There will be a recording on the Open Channels website, and there will be a PDF on the MPA Center website. So you can just check back uh, within a, a day, and they, those should be up and available. And there's also a note from the Coastal Services Center that just wanted to let people know that the C NOAA's Coastal Services Center does offer a training that helps coastal managers address some of these issues in terms of managing visitor use. And uh, you can go find that if you look at um, training link on the CSC website. Uh, look for visitor use management. So thanks for that. Um, okay, in terms of other questions, uh, there's a there's a a question about, um, can you talk a little bit more about some ideas for developing stakeholders into stewards and advocates for their MPA? Uh, I can start that and, and then I'll pass it to Charlie again. Um, it, the thought was that, um, you know, at the basic level anyway, that by educating um, recreational users and engaging them in on learning about the place where they're doing the recreation, that they would um, understand better about how their actions um, affect the marine environment um, and that they would, um, you know, therefore uh, better understand how to um, how to use the MPA sustainably. Um, and I mean, I think that that's a basic tenet of, um, of uh, you know, engaging um, humans in, um, in the use of, uh, of, of the marine environment or the terrestrial environment. But, you know, the more people understand about, you know, um, what goes into sustaining the resources that they love, the, the more they can, um, you know, act accordingly. And um, also, uh, I think we, we understand that, um, you know, many people don't know the rules for the places that they visit. And, and that's because, well, sometimes the rules aren't that easy to, um, to even get a hold of. Um, and so, that's why we thought, you know, <clears throat> create developing some um, some mobile apps that would enable people to know they're in an MPA and know what the rules of the game are in the MPA would then help them to um, comply with those rules. Charlie, did you want to add to that? Sure, I'll just follow up a little bit. Um, these are ideas that. Um, are being bounced around within the National Marine Sanctuaries Program, which has pioneered a lot of this kind of work over the years. And it, it involves taking all this information about what appropriate types and levels of use are in an area, in a specific area, and conveying it to people in a way that, that actually not only changes their behavior, but engages them in stewardship. And there are ways to do that, you know, there's one-on-one -on -one outreach and education, but also there are user groups, you know, dive clubs and organizations 
there are charters, there are guides, there are kayak stores that can provide information. And so the, the idea would be to, on parallel tracks, develop the information base for what is the appropriate way to pursue a specific recreational activity and then find the, the venues and the mechanisms to not just get that to the user, but to engage the user in explaining that and, and uh, spreading the word to their colleagues. And so that, uh, as you can imagine, is very context and site specific, but I think if, if we go down that road a little further, we may find that, that a lot of these issues uh, kind of take care of themselves without a lot of governmental interference. Okay, thanks, Charlie. And just while we're on the on the subject of user behavior and uh, enforcement, there's also a question that maybe could be viewed as a suggestion, which is about educating federal and state prosecutors as part of the enforcement capac component and making sure that prosecutors understand what's involved in prosecuting MPA violation cases where that's appropriate. I I think that's an excellent idea. Uh, that's the <clears throat> the arena behind the curtain that many of us don't really think about, but it, it, it's a very important part of that whole process. And again, a comment on an earlier uh, answer that was given about the need for additional um, science to support these carrying capacity questions, uh, a comment that we need to make sure those resources that we're asking for trickle down to MPA managers because often federal level data isn't applicable to site specific needs. Uh, and we need to make sure that that's addressed. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point because a lot of these issues, you know, the the specific use and its specific impacts are 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 not generalizable very readily, and that means that we have to engage people on the ground to develop both the data and the tools and the programs to make this work, and that's kind of one of the reasons why we went this route of asking the FAC to make these recommendations back to the government is because it's it's largely the government and its MPA managers who need to hear and adopt some of these ideas and, and to be you know supported in doing that. And again on that subject we have a comment from Cliff McCready of the Park Service who has been involved in some of these studies and just wanted to point out that um, we actually have done some work in MPAs, which uses different methods than terrestrial areas, but has looked at um, visitor experiences of crowding and how that can be used to limit or zone the density of people in sensitive areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, well, that's definitely true. And the Park Service is, uh, as is often the case, on the cutting edge of a lot of this stuff. So our, our hope is that by highlighting the this general issue that we can bring all of those kind of independent bodies of knowledge together and actually develop a government-wide approach that makes sense in each location and in each program. I, I uh, neglected to mention Cliff McCready, um, who was a very important uh, uh, addition to our um, discussions um, in the subcommittee. Uh, though he's not a fact member, he was uh, very helpful in his input to that to that committee. Thanks, Cliff. Okay. Um, there's a question about the survey um, that we proposed, Charlie, that you mentioned, and uh, asking, uh, can you describe a little bit more about that and how you plan to approach that, what methods you plan to use? Sure. Um, as, as many of you probably know, if, if you're interested in this topic, you probably encountered the uh, frustrating lack of useful data on patterns and trends and impacts and benefits of, of any kind of ocean use, much less recreational uses. And that's kind of exacerbated in the, in the recreational realm because they're not typically highly regulated activities. There isn't an internal reporting system. There's not a lot of uh, surveillance and monitoring. and so. It's one of those things that we know is going on and we see them and we bump into them, but we don't really have any data to, to back up much of what we're trying to do. <clears throat> so our, our first step 
in addition to some of the other work that the center is doing on documenting some of these patterns and potential conflicts, is to um, try to establish through a survey that, that there actually is an issue and there is a concern. And from that, to then begin to uh, develop the, the actual research programs to, to document what these uh, activities are, who uses them, when, and what their impacts are. And so in order to do that, we're starting uh, in, in a pretty general kind of expert opinion approach where the, the survey is aimed at uh, marine protected areas managers in the U.S. And it asks a series of questions, most of which ask for their professional uh, judgment or expert opinion on trends or concerns. So because there are a uh, few data out there and, and when they do exist, they're, they're not generalizable beyond a single site or a single program, we're, we're planning to ask things like, uh, you know, what, what level of concern do you have over the ecological impacts of any of these 15 uses? High, low, medium, whatever. And <clears throat> what we're seeking to get from it is not rigorous data that, that actually documents something on the ground, but gives us a picture, a kind of window into what the managers who are really having to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis are experiencing, uh, what they uh, perceive and what they're worried about and what they think are priorities for action. So the, the current survey, which we're still developing, has uh, about 10 questions, one of which is a fairly detailed one that goes through uh, aspects of 15 different recreational uses, asking about its potential for conflicts and ecological impacts and uh, trends over time and current status. That will give us a kind of a snapshot, if you will, of what the situation looks like now and what the managers think about it in terms of what we may or may not need to do in the future. So it's, it, it's a very qualitative thing, but uh, it's the first step, and it's kind of where we are in, in this realm at the moment. Okay. Well, we need to um, wrap up here in a minute, so I just want to hit a couple of quick things. One is uh, someone's written in and, and commented that there's an MPA watch program in California where citizen scientists can collect observational data on human use around MPAs, and this could be a great source of information. So Dana, we'll definitely follow up with you about that. That sounds like a, a great lead. Mm -hmm. um, also, another comment about the carrying capacity discussion that just notes that if uh, we have rules based on what people perceive as arbitrary determinations of appropriate uh, levels without a connection to objective measures, it could create a lot of ill will among users. So it's something that really needs to be looked at carefully. Um, but the last, yes. the last question I wanted to throw out to you all to wrap up is um, that the group has made great recommendations. So what are the next steps as far as the agencies go and, and implementation? Great. I'm glad somebody, we were hoping somebody would ask that question. Charlie, take it away. Okay. As, <laughs> as the token fed, I can answer. Uh, so that, that's sort of the, the fundamental issue, really, is so what? Uh, and as, as some of you probably know and others might imagine, it, it has occurred in the past and sometimes recommendations from various kinds of advisory groups uh, get to their target, and the response is, thank you for your input, and nothing changes. Uh, that's not what we have done this for. That's not our intention. And, and we have basically a, a plan of action to make sure that something changes. And what, what we're doing at the moment now is <clears throat> working to leverage these two documents, the facts, specific recommendations to the agencies, as well as the broader and more general uh, call to action to raise the profile of this issue both within the government and beyond, and then to start working the machinery within the government, which is slow and cumbersome, but it can be done, <coughs> to, to get people actually 
prioritizing these these needs that have been identified in these questions and focusing resources on them and actually engaging with partners outside the government to make real progress. So what's different about this, I think, is that our plan all along was that the recommendations were not the end point. It was, in effect, the starting point. And what comes now is, is the hard work, both internal and external, with many of you on the phone, to uh, turn these ideas into meaningful change and meaningful action. So if any of you want to help, uh, we'd be glad to have you. Hello? Lauren? OK. Um, Sorry, I'm talking I'm and I'm on mute. I just wanted to okay. say thank you. And also just to let uh, folks know that Carrie Cahill of National Park Service mentioned that the Interagency Visitor Use Management Council is working on a capacity guidebook that will also help managers who are struggling with this issue. So I want to thank our two presenters uh, who did a great job, and I also want to thank everyone for calling in. I think this has been a great dialogue, and we do have contact information for those of you who uh, made some suggestions, so we'll definitely be following up with you. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Great. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon.